All right, let's welcome in our guest from the Phoenix Suns, Mikel Bridges. Mikel, what's up, man? What's up, my boy? How you doing? I'm great. I'm great. So I was telling Tommy this earlier. I'm still trying to figure out, do you owe me money? No, bro. No, I do not. <laughs> I sent the money because I remember Josh hit me up and was like, oh, like, obviously, obviously as a joke, but serious, like, pay my boy his money. I was like, oh, I forgot. So I sent the bread and that's it. And now you still trying to bring it up, bro. I've been getting no, no. your money. I couldn't remember. I knew one of you guys owed me money. So Tommy, just a little backstory here. Uh, I, I got eliminated early from the bubble on Sunday and the Suns were still in it. But I think it was Damian Lillard basically sealed their fate uh, of not getting in the, the playing game. And... Ty Jerome and Mikel were like, can we get a ride back with you to the New York area? Because obviously it was mid COVID. No one's, you know, I had just been tested. I'm going to see my family. No one's uh flying commercial out of the bubble. We're just trying to get safely to somewhere, you know, that, that we're going to go see our family. So these guys tagged along with me and I told them you can have, you can fly on the plane for free. We're flying PJ. And all I need is some money for your drivers. Because I set up the drivers. I think you were going to Philly and he was going from West West Hampton. Yeah, he was going down, way down. Yeah, Yeah. He was going from New York to Virginia? From West Hampton, which he had to go from West Hampton all the way through New York City. Yeah, you need money for that driver. Yes. He was was, was in that car for a long time. Okay. All right. So I need to text Ty then. Because I think he still owes me like nine hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of crazy to fly all the way up just to drive halfway back down. But the other option was to get on a commercial flight out of Orlando and catch COVID. <laughs> <laughs> <Guaranteed>. <laughs> catch COVID. <laughs> I've, they both figured this was the safest route. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, CP's play last night, where he uh, dribbled between his legs, faked out Anthony Edwards. And then miss the layup. <laughs> I feel like the internet is so starved for content that we're going to show a highlight of a guy dribbling between his legs, but not continue the highlight where he misses the layup. <laughs> did y'all did y'all give him any shit for that? No, not really, because the move was so tough, and it was in a situation where like we could have scored. Like if you watched that game yesterday, like we couldn't make nothing. Like. Literally not one single shot. So when he made that move, he was in a tight game. The score is like 60 to 60. And we're in, we're in our fourth quarter, bro. It's like 66, right? What is going on? And, you know, C is always creative. And we just played Houston. And he just went between uh, the dude's legs, the, the young guy, or whoever. He just, he just came in. I just felt bad for him. Um, so he comes out with that. So I wanna, I'm, I'm on a bench. So I got up all getting all crazy. And then I saw, I saw what was next. I saw Cat coming down and see he couldn't get to his pull up. It had to be like a, a all the way to the rim layup, which was would get blocked. Or he had to shoot a really high floater. So I kind of and how our night was going, I, I did not think he was really gonna make the shot anyway. I was just so gassed up. I got the move. So the shot, I didn't even care. Like just like how you're saying about everybody, I didn't care about the shot. The move was so crazy, I was still. Hooked. I wasn't even thinking he was going to make that shot in the first place. I have a couple sort of thoughts on this play. First of all, I don't think we should be showcasing highlights of dribble moves where the guy then misses the shot. It's very and one mixtape esque. I don't like it. It's not good for basketball. Why? They're, they're two different plays. I'm a, I'm talking. A, they're, they're not two different plays. It's a continuation of play. You made a great move. You missed a shot. Okay, million dollar move, two dollar finish. So if you cross somebody up, if if you cross somebody up and they fall down and you miss the shot, they shouldn't. JJ, JJ, if if, if you're playing and you cross somebody up, you say you make somebody fall, but you miss the shot, oh, uh, you're going you're going to talk about you dropping somebody. I know you. No, no, you won't. And I will say this: I'm gonna Actually, I'm gonna break I'm gonna break a rule here. I'm gonna break a rule here. But when I played for Orlando, and LeBron was on the Heat, I made him touch Earth. <laughs> but I missed the jumper. Okay. He did a little twirl. He touched earth. He did a little twirl. 
but I missed the jumper. And this is the first time I've ever brought it up. I don't think it's a good move. Okay, There's a good move okay. to it. And I missed a shot. Well, see, you you shoot, you're you're a, a shooter for days, and you a guy to hit 20 in a row, miss the next one, be mad. So that, that's not even take about shots. That's why that's why you're so like, well, if you miss a shot, you're so I probably I don't even I know how you probably was raised where you miss one shot, you're like, it's in the world. But say how about a layup or a floater that you probably don't shoot as much. Mm-hmm. I bet you wouldn't be that mad. But jump okay. shot, a guy like you that shoots so many jump shots and think you should make every single one. I see yes. why you're upset. But a floater or something, I bet you you'll be you'll talk about that highlight. As soon as I saw the clip start, I was at the Knicks game last night, so I didn't watch it in real time. But as soon as I cl- saw the clip start, I thought to myself, Chris is gonna do the fake behind the <laughs> Behind the back, be, behind the back, or whatever, between the legs, behind him, and then grab the ball and take it in. Like it's, just, it was just so obvious. It was seventeen years of corporate knowledge versus two years of corporate knowledge. Um, I will say this: his move against the Rockets, and and forgive me for not uh, being able to to know the young fella's name who had just checked into the game, but that was one of the cleanest nutmegs I've ever seen in the NBA. I've seen a lot of nutmegs. But the way he controlled the ball after he nutmegged it right into his jumper, right that was court. pretty smooth. That was smooth. That was not. He, I don't know how he gets it. It's like it looked like he just went between his own legs. Like it just comes right back to him. That's how much he has a ball in the string. It's like it's so it's so crazy, bro. Because imagine one of us trying to. I swear, uh, ball go go to the opponent. And I might not. I might not play for five minutes. Coach wants to sit me on that bench. I can't even picture trying that. That's crazy. There, it's there's a little bit of kahunas required to uh, to even try a move like that. Um, I want to. I actually want to start kind of talking about Chris a little bit, and 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 that'll segue a little bit into Monty as well. Uh, your first two years there, not a lot of success uh, team wise. Uh, you guys go on the bubble run, which we'll touch on in a moment. But then uh, last off season, you added Chris through a trade. You hired Monty Williams. In terms of changing the culture and the leadership, what did you see from Chris from day one where you kind of knew, oh, it's going to be different around here? I think just this communication. I think the first day, just I think when we met before we even had training camp, uh, he was just already voicing, talking about everything before we even had a chance to even have the ball on the court together. So, you know, we just came in at night for film. And he was already talking about everything and getting ready for it. And that was kind of shocking for me, especially the past couple of years, you know, being on Suns and having like a, you know, young team, things like that. But that shocked me off the jump, is, you know, because, um, you know, CP, you know, the Hall of Famer and just being young and being the first time playing with him, you're not you don't know what to expect, but you kind of have an idea. And um, just off Jump Street, him coming in and voicing Right when we got there, kind of was like I like like okay, this is yeah this is this is Hall of Fame CP that everybody talks about that he's a leader and he's gonna he's gonna talk and you know from from that point on that's when I realized that C was that type of leader. I was gonna I was gonna ask just from being around him for the last two years, he's he's very short. He's a short man. He's a short man, and by NBA standards, he's an old man. How is he able – those things generally don't work well for playing at at an all-NBA level late in your career. What do you see from him on a day-to-day basis that you think allows him to play at that level? So one, and that goes to him take care of his body and, you know, his lifts and all that stuff. Like, he's – you can tell he mastered that. You know, he, the, the guy's vegan. You know, he – comes in you know he has his trainer and he knows like what lifts he's doing he know, he needs to do is at a certain time like his routine every game day is just like spot on every single time so that's that's step one and step two is just his iq that's what it really is like he takes care of his body so he could be out there and, and play but his iq is just so it's just so separate for a lot of people man and it's just that's what is going to always keep him on that floor until he's 50 and can't barely move a bone on, on that court. It's just his IQ and how smart he is. He just knows the game so well. It's, it's unbelievable. Do you ever get annoyed with him because he talks so much? 
Oh, me and C, we go we go back and forth a lot on the court. Oh my gosh, he's like, he's one he's one of dudes where like it's it's funny where we had that relationship where we get mad if something happens and like he'll snap or I'll snap and then the next second I'm in the corner. He's about to shoot a pull up, and I'm in the corner screaming like "way up!" Like you know, like that's the layup for him. So I'm like, it's just this is back and forth, but it's, it's competitive, man. We want we want to win, and you know, you got you got two guys. See, see, never wants to be wrong, and you got a guy like me who grew up only child. So I've been spoiled my whole life. So it's tough with me as well. So um, for me, see, it's we got our. If you know our friendship is hilarious, but uh, oh yeah, we definitely go back and forth all the time. We're gonna to get to the we're gonna to get to the, some of the Nova stuff in a minute, but I was just curious uh, what you think about the difference between winning culture in college and winning culture in the pros is. Because obviously, your I mean your track record in college is as good as it gets, but then you come to a situation in the NBA where you're you're losing at first and you're sort of having to figure it out. And Chris has sort of mastered both sides of this. Yeah, uh, it's, it's it's different. Um, you know, obviously in college is. The coaches and everything it's they run everything you know you're a kid in college and you know we had to give our phones up stay in hotels night before home games and things like that you know now as you get older you're more mature you're, you have your you got your own you know you do whatever you want but um but you gotta be smart and i think for us we got the guys where we also we you know it's not just i feel like at college we felt like we was we was an army you know what i'm saying we felt like it was you can't do nothing. Like it's just straight basketball, school. Like you gotta our fun was just being, you know, we obviously we have our fun like off season or stuff like that, but our fun was winning and you know, being around each other. The league could do obviously a little bit more, but the thing about us, our our team, we're just we're connected, man. And we feel like a college team, you know. I think just things we do together, like going to dinners and hanging out on off days together is just reminds me of college and which is kind of rare in the league and everybody told me that when I came in like it's it's going to be different you know you you got your best friends in college you guys hang around all the time in the league guys they have their own lives and you're going to see them at practice and games and you're not going to be around them as much and it kind of was like that a little bit my first couple of years um obviously you find friends that you hang out with but it's not it wasn't like a team like at 15 people pulling up at somebody's house but now it's like that and it's dope just to see it. Uh, stealing cell phones aside, from a teaching and a basketball attention to detail standpoint, are there sim- similarities between Jay uh, and Monty? Oh, 100 percent. They they remind me of each other so much. You know, the whole attention to detail. That's what Coach Wright preaches, and so does Monty. And um, that's why I think it helps me with Monty because. I look at him and every time he talks, I, I get the PTSD of Coach Wright, you know. So I'm like, <laughs> I, I already know how this goes. You know, I got to I gotta lock in, look at, you know, Monty makes jokes all the time. You know, if I talk a little bit when he's talking, he's like, I know you didn't do that at Villanova, you know. And I'm just like, first of all, I'm not going to get into that because, you know, there's a main corporate out there who talks on the court. You know, there's a main corporate is Jay. I'm not going to talk about it. Gets me in trouble all the time. I'm not, we already talked about them earlier, but um, they they're the same. They're the same people, man. They the thing is they care so much. You know, they care so much about the players and um and a game and winning. So uh, those those dudes like you, I know they're close. You know, he might have been in practices when I was in college. So I know those guys definitely are close together. I had a little bit of PTSD last season. I spent five years with Stan in Orlando. And we went through it. Uh, there were times where we disagreed on a lot of stuff, but in the end, it made me a better player. I, I was so appreciative of those five years. But I can remember early last season, you talk about the, the meeting before training camp. It was like an hour and a half meeting and Stan's talking. And I remember sitting there and thinking to myself, Am I sick to my stomach or am I really enjoying this? There, <laughs> there's a little bit of hesitancy there where I'm like, do I have to go through this again? Oh, you know, no, I, this in the long run, in the long run, this is a good thing. Um, <laughs> those two guys, though, 
because because you guys as a, as a group, the younger guys had been there. Um, do you think that the the change in culture, uh, specifically ar- around winning um, and stability too, was driven by them, and, or was some of that just you, Book, DeAndre maturing a little bit? I think it's a mix of both. Um, I really think it's Monty, you know, if you want to do like 60-40 or 70-30, I think it was it's Monty, man. Him coming in with the staff and right when he came in, just establishing that culture and get everybody lock in. And um, But us, you know, as players, and you know, like everybody is pretty much capable of being that, but some people, some players just don't and some players don't have the right coaching to let them even do that. You know, some coaches let guys just do whatever they want. And at a certain time, you know, they, they're, that's what they're comfortable with. So when a new coach come in, they're like, I'm not doing none of that. You know, my old coach for past four or five years, let me do whatever I want. Or like in books case, you know, having a new coach every year and they're, they're, they're probably scared of like, you know what I'm saying? They're probably scared of losing their job and you're not going to get the, the best player, you know, the, the face of the franchise, man, you know, that's the last thing you want to do. So you let guys like that do, you know, do whatever they want. You know what I'm saying? So um, it's just all how you come in the league and what coaches are around you. But I think Monty, man, he got everybody locked into the culture. But I think we all had it inside of us. You know, I know I did from college. I was just, you know, one year without Monty. You know, he came in my second year. So it was a quick turnaround for me. And but Everybody else, they all had it. It's just, you know, you just need you need somebody to, you know, get guide you and, and get you there. With, with a little bit of time and perspective, looking back at the bubble now, um, what do you think the biggest impact it had on the run last year was? Obviously, you know, you guys played great down there and you continued that in, but was there was there anything in particular that stands out? No, I, like that ain't no. I know everybody just like, and if you watch, like everybody didn't play, Everybody, you know, the opponents we played, you know, they had some players like CP played like the first quarter, like when we played OKC. Um, but that wasn't like we wasn't thinking like that. I think our whole thing was just, you know, we got we we weren't we weren't supposed to be here. You know, they just put us to go to bubble just, you know, just because they need a body for real. That's what it felt like. And we knew even if we go eight and know our odds still like you saw like you saw with. Freaking Dame and them had to had to go crazy so we couldn't you know make it. But um, we just we it was we knew it was just us against everybody, and that that got us real close. And being that bubble, it's like college. It's like we're we're in a hotel. You know what I'm saying? You can't go nowhere, so you're forced like you're forced to be around your teammates and coaches all the time. And and the guys that we have, you know, we're all good dudes and. Young of age, we all got close in that bubble and, you know, took that to heart. You know, people will count us out. And even though we didn't make that, um, make the playoffs when we 8-0, we had that type of, you know, we had that going off season. You know, before I go, before I go to the beach, go to my Jersey Shore, get a little wild out there, you know, we all feeling good. You know, we feel like, all right, you know, these these teams, we, 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 we're going to the right direction. And then, shoot, you see with C coming and then Jay. Then we start now. We start looking like, all right, we're really trying to build something. Yeah, I think the only reason you guys were in the bubble was just to make it an even amount of teams so that Zion could be in the bubble. Basically, exactly. is like the best way to describe it. The league, the league <laughs> wanted Zion in the bubble. I mean, that's basically what it comes down to. <laughs> when so there, there obviously was some momentum, and I know you, you. It's it's actually refreshing to hear you acknowledge that. Some of those games, teams weren't necessarily playing with the same sense of urgency that you were playing with in the bubble in trying to sort of get into that play playing game. Um, there was some momentum, I'm, I'm sure, and some confidence gain and, 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 a, and a good feeling to end the season. You guys trade for Chris. You hire Monty. Um, or, I'm sorry, you got Monty now. At 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 what point last season did you feel like you were really good. Do, was there was there a game, a moment? Was it early in the season? Was it after a long run? At what point were were you like, oh, we we could potentially make a deep playoff run? 
We started, I remember we started off, we started off eight and eight. Um, I think we had a couple bad losses, which kind of turned everything around. I think we lost at home kind of early to OKC. And, you know, they were, they, they were, them boys trying to lose. <laughs> and they, they beat us. So we was just like, what are we really, what are we really doing? And Monty usually not the guy that really, you know, Monty don't curse, he don't do none of that. And he just, he doesn't yell at you. But you could tell after that loss, like, there was no more, like, come on, guys, like, we got to be better. Like, no, it was straight up, like, no, we're going to get better. Like, I promise you we're going to get better. And this is not acceptable at all. And I think from that, from that standpoint, I think from, from that point on, we just, we felt, I felt that. And I felt that personally, and we all did felt that energy for Monty. Like, okay, we don't want to see Monty, you know, Monty, the greatest dude in the world. We don't want to see him like this. You know, we don't want to see him like that mad, you know. So um, we kind of locked in from there. You know, had some big games that we won. Uh, I think. I think always beating Utah when they were number one, you know, number one in the uh, West and beating them kind of always, you know, felt like, all right, yeah, we're nice. And then going on an East Coast trip, beating Philly and beating the Knicks on their, uh, on their win streak. I think they won like, dang, Knicks won. How many, you remember? Was they at least like eight, nine in a row? Yeah. And they were so locked in and we came in there and won that game. So. You know, I think when we lost to OKC, it kind of was that turning point where we felt like, all right, we got to pick it up. Did you feel, did you feel slept on at all going into the playoffs? Like, remember, it was the, everyone was sort of jockeying for the, the six through eight seeds. And it did feel a little bit like, even though you guys were the two, nobody was being like, oh, we want to avoid Phoenix. Um, I mean, I, I trust, I'm, I'm the, I'll be real with everybody. Yeah, I mean... Sure, you know, I, I get it. You know, you got guys, this is the first time we all been together. You know, first time me, Book, DA, like we've been in the playoffs. And especially it's a, that new group with us, with the whole starting five was, was new. Um, but for me personally, I know for a team, we ain't care too much. You know, some guys take it more personal than other, but I just feel like, you know, what I learned from college is just, you can't just, you, you just can't really just turn it on like that at just like, okay, it's playoffs. Let's, let's be a better team. You got to have that throughout the regular season. And maybe, maybe it comes late, but you just can't not play not that well regular season and think like, okay, it's the playoffs. Like we could just change like this. Like, no, like there's teams that have been, that's been hungry and that's been playing out the, the ass off for about a couple months now and trying to get to the playoffs, you know? And I think everybody's thought was like, we was ex- inexperienced, but we had guys that was just ready to hoop, man. I think that's the whole, that's the biggest thing. You had guys like C, who's been there, who's wanting to win. Jay, who just came off being in the finals, losing. The, you know, you had guys that are hungry. Then guys who haven't been there and want to want to prove that you no, know, they should be here. And um, that's why I think guys like C. Payne, you know, obviously book. Everybody talk about book not being the playoffs, and you know, he's not an uh, asset on a winning team. He just puts up numbers on losing teams. Now, I know he has had a chip on his shoulder with that. Um, so we just had a lot of guys ready for the moment. To Tommy's point, there had, though, to have been an extra sense of satisfaction when you beat the Lakers. First of all, they were the defending champs. But secondly, there was some, there was some scheming on their part to sort of end up. It was almost like they wanted us. They wanted 100%. us. 100%. Yeah. Was there an extra sense of satisfaction on that? Yeah, and you know, you felt that, especially even if it's even if it's true or not. But we felt like, okay, they they want to they want to play us at the seven two. Like they want to play us. And us as hoopers, I don't give I don't, I don't give a damn who's on the other side. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like we're like, all right, we ready to hoop and we know what it's been like a regular season. We know when we really play them and how we match up with them, that we match up with them pretty well. And we was ready. You know, I remember we was watching the, um, we was watching, we was all at, at, at CP's house and we was watching them play the, uh, play the Warriors. And, you know, I got friends and everybody, the Lakers, this, they're texting like, 
you know, who do you want to win? Who do you want to play? You rather play them? Who who'd you rather want to play? And everybody's like, I know you don't want to play Lakers because it's LeBron and AD and things like that. And I'm sitting here like, man, shit, like I want them. You know what I'm saying? Like you beat them, obviously you're the defending champs, but you get past them first round. Then after that, it feel like you beat the, t- like you play one of the toughest teams early. And if you get them early, then you'll have that confidence going into the next rounds. And, um, but no, it's crazy. Every, as soon as we saw Lakers won, everybody had that look on their face, like it's time. And we, we know it's going to be tough. You know, obviously having LeBron and AD over there, you know, it's going to be tough, but, um, you know, we stayed locked in and it was ready for a moment. Denver really n- had no shot against you guys. You swept them in the second round. Then you played the Clippers in the conference finals. Which series do you think was tougher and more taxing and harder to sort of get over that hump? Was it the Lakers series or was it the Clippers series? Oof. Wait, I think, man, that was tough. Lakers was tough because I remember C- CP getting hurt. Um, CP was playing with one shoulder, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like that. Was, that was kind of tough, and yeah, you know, you know, I get with Brian and AD with the refs out there. It's kind of it's tough, man. You can't like you you be aggressive. The dudes is two fifty throwing their body around, but then when you touch them, it's a foul. It's can you do like me? You you know, I feel I'm looking at refs like I can't be that strong. You know, I look 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 at. Look at look at him. Look at like look at me. There's no way I did that to him. I put him on the ground. Like there's no way, you know. So um, I just it, that was tough. I that the Clippers. I think their biggest thing was when they switched one through five, and then getting a the guy like Terrence Mann confidence. You know when they when when they when Utah played them and they put Gobert on him and he was busting his ass. You know, Terrence Mann came in our series like, yeah, put a five on me again. Like I'm like I'm locked in. And he was he was hooping for them. And obviously PG and all those guys over there. So I I honestly it's really CP with the one shoulder. That's why it was really tough. And then their whole scheme in the defense and on uh the Clipper side was just unbelievable in the coaching and obviously the players they have. Terrence Mann he he was he had a couple moments uh, in our series with the Mavs as well in the first round. He at times was a superhero for them mm-hmm. in the playoffs. He saved multiple games, in, in, including some turning points. Reggie Jackson too. It's Reggie Jackson too. Oh yeah, Reggie yeah. Jackson. Oh yeah, that was him. Yeah. Um, the mindset up to zero. I'm not trying to bring up a sore subject. I'm just trying to get in your head a little bit. But the mindset up 2-0 in the finals, going to game three, and then losing four straight. I'm sure it took some time to sort of uh, reflect on an incredible season, of course, but on an opportunity lost. And then moving into this season, did you guys internally in the offseason have discussions was everybody devastated? Was everybody wiped out? I know it was one of the weirdest seasons ever, but where were you sort of internally as a team after losing those four games in a row against Milwaukee? It was tough, you know. It was tough, obviously. We we all wanted to win. Like I said, we feel like the college team, man. We just – we all love each other, and um, it just kind of hurt, you know. We all, we all wanted to win. We all wanted to – freaking be drunk at the parade. We all want to do all that, man. We all want to just be together. Um, But yeah, to lose four straight, it was tough. Each time you lose, it's just like, can't let them win again. Like, we got to get this one. Then they just come back and win that one. And then same thing, like game six, like, all right, can't let them win this one for sure. Like, at least let's, we messed up. Let's at least bring it back to the crib game seven and, you know, win that one. And um, came short, but you know that's credit to them. You know they, the players they have, you know, um, the coaching like they they did a hell of a job. Obviously, Giannis, Drew, and Middleton, them dudes just unbelievable. With you know everybody out there, Bobby and Pat, you know all them dudes coming in and hooping. It was tough, man, but 
like money makes it easier for everybody, man. It's just money knowing that obviously it's going to suck. We're all competitors, but at the end of the day, you know, life goes on. Um, we, we lo- you lose in life, you know what I'm saying? Like, what are you going to do after, you know, are you going to just soak on it? First of all, we have that much time to even soak on it because damn season started back up in a month and a half. So really we had a quick turnaround. So there was no time to sit there with a box of tissues and whine about it. Cause you guys had to get back in the gym a couple weeks after. So, um, we just, you know, just shit, life goes on, man. Just live with it, you know, know what we have to do and, and try to get back. And that's where we're on right now. So for the listener, the viewer, we're, we're recording this on November 16th, uh, Tuesday night. Suns just won their ninth in a row. With with the way the season ended, a little bit of a slow start. Obviously, you've won nine in a row now. Do you feel like you're being overlooked a little bit this this year? And some of this, of course, is uh, the Warriors' hot start. But do you feel like you're being overlooked as a contender in the West this year? Um, I guess so. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm. I promise you, Jay. I ain't one of them. I ain't one of them guys. It's not. It's not on your radar. That's no. Then that's then that's the coach, right, man? That that dude got me wired to this day about not worrying about whether people will know that stuff. But I like love that. Just about none of that. So I just, I don't, you know, I really don't care about that. That's who, 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 who are who are the people that's overlooking us? What is it? Well, I can tell you this. Is it reporters? <laughs> I can tell you this. I spent about seven fucking hours at ESPN today, and I don't know that the Suns were brought up in any of my five appearances. Well, other than Chris's move, other than Chris's move, that is crazy. Did nine in a row and not not be brought up. That's that's crazy. If ESPN, Fox Sports, whatever, NBA TV, if, if the motherfuckers are they, are, are they the ones lacing up? Are they playing against us? Then I don't give a damn what they think. They, if they want to come on that court and play against us, then shit, they could, they'd be more than welcome to step on that court with us. But what what is what does their voice have to say? Like. That's no, I, 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 yeah, I'm, 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 I'm agreeing with you. I'm, in, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I, I think it's, I, but I think it's, I think there was, there was probably, uh, given uh, Kawhi's injury, um, uh, Lakers at times being beat up last year, then them going to get Westbrook. I think there was a, a certain group of NBA pundits, and certainly NBA fans who looked at the run last year as a one-off. I'm not saying it was a fluke, because it certainly was a fluke. You guys beat some great teams and some great players, and you were in a position to win an NBA championship, but maybe a one-off magical run where it looks like right now you guys are in position again to make a deep playoff run and a championship run. That's all I'm saying. No, I, and I no, trust me, I, I hear you 100%. I'm just, I'm just telling you my side where like, I, I, but I'm different, you know, there's, everybody's different, you know, everybody, a lot of people read that and a lot of people like that gives them motivation, you know what I'm saying? Like a lot of people play better because they're not put in this ranking or they're not, they don't, you know, they, ESPN don't rank them this and that and that gets some motivation. Everybody gets their motivation different. I don't give a damn what people say about me what, or what I deserve or what ranking it should be. Like that's, that shit don't be nothing. Like I got to do what I got to do on the court, you know? If I'm ranked 50, if I'm ranked 90, ranked 80, like, what the hell? I'm just like, I'm going to walk on the court like, hey, man, make sure when you guard me tonight, hey, I'm ranked 87 on ESPN. Just know that. The dude's like, oh, shit. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, what the hell are they going to do for me? You know what I'm saying? So, like, everybody's different, but I get what you're saying. Obviously, I see that. I see that a lot about with the injuries and stuff, but, I mean, shit, what do you, what do you, what do you want us to do? You know what I'm saying? Like, I know, obviously, Jamal was hurt and Kawhi was hurt, but like, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm sorry. Like, I don't know what, what do you want us to do. I, I, we go out there and we get a scout and we see what team we play and first team to four. That's I, that's all I feel. And then, you know, I'm, I'm saying we did three straight, um, three straight, uh, freaking against three different teams, three series, and then you know, came up close on the last one, but. Just control what you control, man. It's just I always pray for people with no injuries, but it's, obviously it sucks part of the game. But I think whoever's out there, you just got beat. Whoever's out there for you, but I don't know. 
The guys over at Roback sent us some of their products, and we'll be honest, we were blown away with the quality and comfort. We can confidently say best fit, best feel. First, Roback's performance polos are truly game-changing. You won't find a better-looking, better-feeling performance polo. Their collars don't lose their shape, and their four-way stretch is unmatched. Second, Roback's new performance hoodies are a total game-changer. Maybe the softest, stretchiest hoodies in the game. You know, we are experienced hoodie guys, and we literally wear them all the time. I probably wear their performance hoodies to school drop-off three times a week. That's not an exaggeration. They literally are the most comfortable performance hoodies I've ever worn. Third, Roback's performance Q-zips are incredibly comfortable. They're perfect for a day in the office, for me, a round of golf, or a night out. They're the definition of versatile. In all honesty, Roback has been gaining traction big time. Every time you see someone wearing Roback, you just give them that subtle nod because you know they get it. Use the code OLDMAN on Roback.com for a generous 20% off your first purchase. That's spelled R-H-O-B-A-C-K.com. That's 20% off all polos, Q-zips, hoodies, and tees with the code OLDMAN. They just dropped new hoodies and Q-zips that will have you feeling good and looking fresh. Not to mention, Roback polos make great gifts for the holidays. Making content is an essential part of what we do to keep this show going. And anyone who has a podcast or posts regularly knows it's not an easy and seamless creative process. But with Canva Pro, you can design anything like a pro on any device. Canva Pro is a design platform that empowers you to create and share stunning content in just a few clicks, and it's amazingly fun and fast. You can choose from thousands of templates that are easy to customize or start from scratch. Canva Pro is endless premium fonts, photos, videos, and so much more that add personality and edge to whatever you're designing. And designing together has never been easier with sharing, editing, and commenting in real time. Canva Pro helps you stay organized on the same page and on top of team projects. No more misplaced files or tedious back and forth. Plus, you and four teammates can unlock everything Canva Pro has to offer for just $12.99 a month. With Canva Pro's Content Planner, you'll save time planning, creating, and posting social media content too. You can pause scheduled posts and edit them at any time. Design like a pro with Canva Pro. Right now, you can get a free, again, free, 45-day extended trial. When you use our promo code, just go to canva.me slash old man to get your free 45-day extended trial. That's C-A-N-V-A dot M-E slash old man. Canva dot me slash old man. We praise uh, Book on the show a lot. Um, I'd say he's up there. For people we sort of talk about the most in sort of a high regard. What do you think makes him so special now being his teammate for a couple of years? I don't know, man. He's just different. He just, he looks on that court and it feels like he get any shot he wants. And he's that talented where tough shots he makes is just like, for me, when I first got there, it was just like, oof, you know, you know, that, that, that one more in the corner could have been nice. You know what I'm saying? Right there, well, that one more in the corner could have been okay. You know what I'm saying? He might do a little dribble to a step back and test the three. I'm like, I was a little open to the left. You know, he could just swung, get an open, catch a shoot. I work on these. Uh, but as time goes on, man, you just be like, all right, like, if I shoot 50% in the corner, like, shit, he shoot 50% when he's contested shots as well. I mean, it looks tough, but he works on it. And he just, he's just gifted, man. And that, this is credit to him, just and how he was raised and how he works on his game and his work ethic and his skill is just praise him. So I want to go back to what you said earlier about a, a knock against him was uh he was a good stats bad team guy um you, you know he couldn't sort of contribute to a winning team wh- which obviously is false there's a parallel this season that i look at and i'm not saying book and zach levine are the same player or one's better than the other i'm not saying that but i am saying they're they're two two guards who can really score the basketball at all three levels and up until this season you could make an argument that the fit around Zach hasn't been great. The coaching has the coaching hasn't been the right fit, and now we're seeing all these factors come together, and Zach can put up numbers on a winning team 
similar to what book did last year when the fit was right. Um, is that accurate? I mean, do you, do you think a lot of it is that just, just the right fit? Yeah, hundred percent. Um, like the players around them and the coaching, you know what I'm saying? Like, I bet you, you know, you could say right now, you know, Shea Alexander just on that team, he's just getting buckets and they're losing a lot. But like if that, if they're rebuilding for years, you know, you just, somebody's going to end up saying like, oh, he can only do this, you know, he can't win. But it's just like, that's a, that's what he's, he's with right now. You know what I'm saying? Like there's, he can't control that. You know, he's in that organization, you know, unless he demands a trade or something, but he can't control, you know, he just does his best trying to do what he do. And sometimes it's, it's it could be a lack of coaching or a lack of talent. You know, the NBA got a lot of, got a lot of nice teams, a lot of nice players and really well coached. And that's what people probably, I think, don't realize the coaching really matters. And um, for Levine's sake, yeah, people probably, if he had another year, if the Bulls were bad, they'd probably be saying the same thing what they were saying on book. But they got the pieces. You know, you got really good coaching, really D. And what he's doing now, the same stuff, and they're winning. So I think the pieces and obviously the coaching and stuff and the culture or whatever, that definitely helps. Let's go back. Let's go back a little bit to draft night. <laughs> when you're drafted by the Sixers, your mother worked for the Sixers. You went to Nova, grew up in the area. What's going through your mind as you get drafted? And then what's going through your mind subsequently when later on you get traded? Well, during the draft, I really thought I was going to either go to New York or I was going to go to Philly. And that was the two things I thought I was going to New York or Philly. And um, once New York got Kevin Knox, I was sitting there. I look at my agents. I'm like, all right. I'm looking at them like waiting for the call. I'm like, all right, so Philly's up next. And then my agents kind of celebrate, got, kind of got the call right before they caught, right before they uh, called me up. I was like, okay, going to Philly. Everybody's been saying I, I've been going to Philly ever since dur during my college, my last year of college. Everybody's like, he needs to stay in Philly. And then once Philly got the 10th pick, everybody during my whole pre draft was like, Philly this, Philly that. Like, there's no way he should not go like 10 to Philly. There's no way, unless somebody just wants to take a bold shot and Tr uh, freaking trading up to get me, but that's just not going to happen. Um, then opportunity come, and I was just like, oh, my God, I'm staying home. And I'm, like, happy as hell, um, ready, excited. And then <laughs> go up there, get my hack in the interview. Was fake about to tear up in the interview. My mom, because my mom joined an interview right after. So I'm like, hold my emotions in. I'm like, it's not the time. Let me just breathe in, breathe out. Go to the media, and I, I'm telling you, JJ, I'm walking in the media, and I'm, I see everybody in there that I, I've known since high school and college, and I call them out by name. Like, they're raising their hand. I'm sitting down on the desk. I'm like, my guy, like, what's up? Like, yeah, I got my hat on. Like, yeah, we've been talking about this. And um, I walk out, and people that escort me, I kind of heard them. You know, they were, they were telling me to wait. They kind of like held me after I did that, after I did the media, because I was supposed to take my pictures and everything. And they're like, you know, they're like listening to something like, hold on, wait. And now I'm, I'm kind of smart, JJ. I'm kind of smart. So now I'm like just reading the room because everybody was just whoever I was just with. They're all happy. And they're like, oh, like they know my whole story. Everybody like who I was with, they know my whole story. They're all happy. Like, oh, like, you know, this is just a dream come true. They all welcome me there. I felt the energy in the room kind of drop. So I'm looking around. I see everybody kind of just like, kind of like that. Damn, like, damn, they did not just do that. So I'm just like, why is everybody a little quiet now? You know what I'm saying? Like, why is everybody quiet? And then I heard people kind of mumble and then I heard trade. Like I heard like people talking and they're just like trade. And I was like, what did you say? I was like, I kind of like interrupted them. Like, wait, what? Like, hold on, hold on. I'm like, no, no, no. What did you just say? They're like, we're trying to figure out. I think there was a trade that happened. So I'm like, Nah, I didn't get traded for Philly. I'm like, what, bro? I'm like, I had a workout there. That was like my best workout. I was hooping. I'm like, they put me through that crazy ass workout. I was dead, bro. I was like, man, there's no way I'm I'm leaving. There's no way unless it's 
shit, like Jimmy Butler, somebody, somebody nice as hell, like, or they just trade, like, all right, get this young motherfucker out of here. Second trade to Phoenix. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, Phoenix. I'm like, bro, I had talked to one person in Phoenix. I ain't, I don't even know who the coach is in Phoenix. I don't know who the GM is. I don't know who the owner is. I don't know anything about Phoenix. Like, not one thing. Not one thing. I know Book. And I know DA. DA just went one. You know, you know what I'm saying? So I'm just like, Phoenix? I'm like, man, hell no. Nah, I ain't say no Phoenix. And like, yeah, you got traded Phoenix. So I'm like, all right. Didn't have my phone on me. Called my mom off uh, one of the people that was escorting me. Called my mom and just told her, like, you know, this is me. Like, are you good? Did you see what happened? She was like, yeah, I was looking for you. Like, are you good? I'm like, well, shit, yeah, I guess so. And then I was a little devastated. Kind of ruined my night a little bit. But then I kind of, like, I was like, well, shit, bro. I just went 10 in the draft. Like, relax. Like, you're not, not the end of the world, bro. You go to Phoenix, a nice-ass city and... You know, obviously, I've been here for four years, and I, I love every bit about it, but it's just me getting my spool ways, thinking I was going to stay home. But, you know, it was, it was tough, man. It was tough. It's worked out for you. You know, you, you've, you've had a, a incremental growth as a player over four years, and you signed a bag. Uh, and now, the next time you have to fly <laughs> for your own safety, <laughs> and you need to take young players with you, you can play, pay for the plane. It's exciting. JJ, I have a question for you. You, yeah. were, in, you were in Philly at this point. Yeah. Uh, what is the what if if the Sixers draft Mikhail and keep Mikhail? All right. I don't know this for sure, but I think there was a first round pick exchanged. Phoenix had Miami's pick. That pick went to uh, Philly in the trade. And then that pick was used to get Tobias. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. That's, I got that right. So Philly doesn't get Tobias. Uh, we have a rookie. I mean, he's probably not going to do shit that year for us. You know, it's, <laughs> I mean, probably. <laughs> I mean, it's whatever. <laughs> Oh, I the, my only thing is for, for just like from a uh, just like a human side, I just think I just think they they drop the ball because it's such a great story, you know. It's mm-hmm. such a great story of like a local kid who who won won at Villanova, whose mother works in the organization. I just think it's a great story. Whether he would have been huge for us my last year there or not, I just think it's a great story. And truthfully. I would have enjoyed getting to hang out with him for a year. That would have been nice. But um, I want to I want to ask you a little bit about just your growth as a player in four years and where I mentioned earlier your your sort of incremental improvement year to year. Um, where do you think your biggest area of growth has been as a player, and where do you think? your biggest area for improvement is like, where do you see yourself and say, all right, in four years, I feel like I can be really good at this and I'm not there yet. Um, I think just create more, you know, being, being pick a role and not just shooting every time, but creating and find others. Um, little, no, little, like, you know, too much about me. My friends know, like, I like passing, you know, that's like a, it's a thing I like. I grew up always wanting to pass. And I just, I don't know. I just think that's my biggest thing, just be able to create more, having the ball in my hands a little bit more. Um, that's why I aim to, you know, obviously it's tough when you got guys like CP and Book and you just continue to work and you can work on ball handling and all the moves and all you want. But if you don't get game reps in it, it's kind of like, is it really there at all times? You know, it's kind of tough. and. I just, you know, just a little day by day, you know, year by year, just trying to get a little bit better. Um, uh, Monty, Coach Mott put me in some situations this year more than I have in the past couple of years. So I think it's just another step that I'm just growing up, growing into. Um, but I think that's the biggest thing, just be more a creator and, you know, put the ball in my hands a little bit more. 
We were talking about this before you uh, before you got on earlier. Uh, I don't know where this was, but somewhere Dame, you came, you came up and Dame called you his favorite small forward in the league. Do you have a certain level of pride about being able to basically like match up with all these guys at different positions and everything like that? And if not, completely shut them down, at least slow them down significantly? Uh, yeah. Uh, with Dame thing, that's my guy too, man. That's just, when I saw that, I was just like, that whole story with me and him, how close we are now. But, you know, he's one of my favorite plays ever. And there was a poster. I was in college. I had a poster of Dame. And um, I think I posted it. I posted a picture on Instagram for my girl's B-Day. And it was a background of Dame's poster. You know what I'm saying? I was like, it's just a big fan, one of the players I like. And now being close with him, that was just dope for him to say that. But, yeah, man, I take a lot of pride. I take a lot of pride just – obviously in defense and just make it tough on a primary defender. Um, I got that in college, just that mentality to be a defender. Um, you know, everybody, everybody can't be, everybody can't be like Dame and book and CP and all the guys. Everybody can't be like that. Um, you know, I just try to find my way and where I'm good at. And, you know, that's one of those things. Well, you're a great example of someone who has embraced their role and then starred in their role. And obviously, there is a financial reward at the end of that. Um, we mentioned defense. We mentioned the shooting. We mentioned the ability to play make more and more year to year. One of your greatest strengths to me is your cutting. I know I, I talked with you about this when we were on the plane, but there was a face cut that you made against us my, my first year with the Pelicans from the corner, which is a, an abnormal cut. Normally, it's a back cut, right? Your ball gets dribbled at you. You back cut. Defender stays below you. You have sort of mastered this face cut from the corner you dunked on Brandon. Was cutting always a natural thing to you, or has that been taught either at uh, the college level or the, or, or the, the pro level? Uh, high school. That's, that's for the high school. My offense was called PC, pass and cut. So um. The reason why you don't see me come off a lot of ball screens nowadays is because in high school, the whole offense, the ball is not even touching the ground. It's pass to the wing from top. You either cut straight to the, to the rim or you go screen away. That guy come curls off you or he back cuts and you come back to the top, swing it, cut again. The next guy rotates. We just all just in a whole circle like that the whole time. So I got that from – um. From high school, man, my coach, Jim Nolan, just, it was just, I'm 6'7", in that league I was in, in my little suburban league, you know, I'm 6'7", 3", and their five men are like 5'10", so I'm just like cutting, throw the ball at the rim, I was catching high, keep it high. And then once I got to college, you know, I, I built on that, you know, just kept cutting. And then uh, my last year, my last year of college came a little simple because I was, one of the guys people are keen on. So, you know, a lot of guys that want the ball so bad, if they get denied, they'll take themselves denied and try to be so greedy to get the ball and, and catch it and, you know, get in a, in a play. For me, you denying me is playing to my shrimps anyway. You know what I'm saying? Like, I became this go-to guy. It took me three years. I kept working on my game. But now you want to deny me, and now you're playing straight to my game. I've been playing for six years straight. And so I'm just – Cut and get dunks, and you know we play at Nova. We use, everybody could pass, so I'm just you got Eric Pascal passing to me, Jalen, Phil, Amari, Dante, all those guys, man. So I love cutting, bro. It's just it's it's fun because I could get a, a quick, a easy two, a easy two, just right at the rim. Having played with uh, two former Villanova guys uh, in Jalen Brunson and Josh Hart, I wish that you had taught them something about cutting because they were two of the worst cutters that I played with in my career. <laughs> Mainly Josh. I used to yell at him all the time. <laughs> like, the dude just, he refused to cut when it was so obvious what he should do. It's It's just... <laughs> Jay Hart, he's getting better. He's getting better. Speaking of, right. speaking of cutting, we're gonna <laughs> cut. We're gonna cut that and put that on Twitter and send that to Josh. When this episode yes, yes. I, I, because I have one other one other question for you. Um, just kind of broad, but like in terms of young guys in the league, so not not your teammates, but like other other young guys in the league who are maybe not as well known. Are there guys you really like watching that you feel like could go on a similar trajectory to the one that you've been on? Yeah. Um, 
you see the youngin in Pelicans right now, Trey Murphy. He's one of those guys. But I think the biggest one right now that I've seen a lot is Vassell off Spurs. Every time he does something, I swear I get tagged in it every single time. Like, every single time. Like, a tag, like, Vassell, Minnie McHale. I'm like, first of all, I'm like, Minnie McHale. I'm like, I'm like, who the hell am I? I'm like, like goddamn, I played three years in the league. Like, I'm an eight, nine-year vet. Like, you know what I'm saying? So I'm like, man, I get they always got to compare somebody to somebody. But, like I said, I hope, I hope, you know, I hope he's better than me. You know what I'm saying? He probably has the ability to – but he's one of those guys I see and I watch. I just like, I see, I see myself with the shooting and the cutting and him defending and stuff like that. He's one of those guys I like watching, just seeing like, obviously I don't compare him to myself, but I just look at him like, oh, I like young skinny wings that can do a lot. that are like those blue guys. I like him a lot too. He's one of my favorite young players to watch. That's a, that's a really good one. I don't know. I, I don't know about the comp, but it's a really good one. It's a mm-hmm. really good one. Thank you. Yeah, I don't get that. The comp is just every time, bro. I'm like, listen, I'm like a couple years older than him. I don't know what you're talking. <laughs> well, we we appreciate the time, Mikel. This has been great. Uh, best of luck. I'm sure I'll see you uh, at a game soon, man. All right, man. Appreciate it, man. Thanks, bro.